promotional purpose. Uh, only those who put an R next to their name, and it's okay uh, to be recorded. We won't record anyone who does not have an R next to their name. Uh, so we just did some brief introductions. When you get into the smaller circles, you can do introductions there also if, if you haven't had a time to uh, a chance to introduce yourself. Um, and we welcome everybody to this uh, Empathy Cafe series. We are gathering the peace building community to network, collaborate, support each other, and build our empathy skills. Uh, we invite other peace building organizations to join us in co-hosting future Empathy Cafes. Uh, we want to host one of these every month. We won't have one in February because we have an Empathy Circle training that month. Uh, our next cafe will be uh, Saturday, March the 4th. If you're interested, you can list your organization in the chat if you're interested in being a co-host. Uh, and uh, I'm Kathy Kitt. I'm with the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy and the Peace Alliance, who is one of the co-hosts. And um, again, let's see. So uh, the event is hosted by the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy. And Edwin's going to share briefly with us who is co-hosting today. Yeah, I'm just uh, doing this uh, screen share. Hopefully that's showing up. These are some of our uh, co-hosts. We have the uh, Center for Building a Culture of Empathy, which uh, Kathy mentioned. We have there the, uh, a leading network on peace building and conflict transformation. They have over 60,000 members on their uh, LinkedIn site and on their website. Uh, we have the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy, which is the internet's largest resource on the value of empathy. And we offer empathy circles and training and host these cafes. There's the Peace Alliance. They educate and mobilize people into action to transform systems and uh, public policy towards a culture of peace. And the Listen First Coalition, which is a network of of 500 plus bridging organizations. And they're in the United States trying to bridge the political social divides in the uh, country. And there's a National Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation. It's a network of innovators who bring people together across the divides to discuss the side and take action together to uh, effectively work on today's toughest uh, challenges, issues. I'm going to stop the share. I'm going to put the link in. Let me see in, of these organizations. These are just the the uh, URL for their websites. You can copy and paste that and visit them at your leisure. So that's it. Thank you, Edwin. And so we're going to move into uh, a six minute video that Edwin's going to share on how to do the empathy circle. And when you get into your smaller groups, that's where uh, you'll really get a feel for what we're doing. And there are people there are experienced who will facilitate the circle. And you may have others in the circle that have been doing this for a while. So if you don't catch it on six minutes, no worries. Me mute here. Somebody is uh, hearing a bit of background noise, so if you if you can, if you're not uh, if you could mute everyone, please. And so this is the video. Let me share that. Getting a bit of background. If uh, somebody could mute them. Everyone mute, please. Okay, here we go. I'm Edwin Rutch, founding director of the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy. I'd like to uh, welcome you to this short presentation on how to take part in a basic empathy circle. So next, let's look at uh, the step-by-step -step how to take part. Uh, an empathy star circle starts with two to seven participants. Here on the screen, we have four participants, which I find is an ideal number. There are four basic roles, and the roles rotate among the participants as the empathy circle unfolds. One, the speaker, is the first person to speak. Two is the uh, active listener who actively listens to the speaker. There's the silent listeners. They quietly observe and witness. And the facilitator who organizes, schedules, and hosts the circle. 
they also do the timekeeping and they have some experience with the process and help keep participants in the process. However, everyone has the responsibility to hold the, the, the process and the practice. So to begin with, the facilitator will start the empathy circle. They welcome the participants. Uh, they uh, lead introductions if the participants don't know each other. The facilitator invites participants to give short introductions, for example, their name, where they're from, and something personal about themselves. Uh, the facilitator then reviews the empathy circle process to remind everyone uh, how it works. They announce the discussion topic, if there is one. Even if there is a topic, you can always talk about what is alive for you. That is, what is on your mind in the moment. And five, uh, you can, they set the speaker time limits, perhaps uh, five minutes, for example. And the facilitator then asks who would like to start the, to be the first speaker. So at that point, the participant volunteers to be the first speaker. As speaker, you select who you will, who will be your active listener, and you can select anyone that you want. Uh, you speak about the topic given or whatever is alive for you. And so you'll speak a bit until you have maybe expressed an idea or two. And then you want to pause to give the active listener a chance to recap what they understand uh, that you are saying and feeling. Uh, if you say too much, the listener may have difficulty in reflecting it. As the active listener, you are listening to the speaker to get an understanding of what they are saying and what is important to them. You are giving them your full attention as a supportive companion on their inner journey and exploration. Uh, when the speaker pauses, uh, you recap your understanding of what they said and how they feel by reflecting the essence of that in your own words. Uh, you can summarize, paraphrase, or even say the speaker's words back to them. Even though you may have a strong impulse to respond with your own ideas, judgments, analysis, advice, and sympathy, or, or even questions, you know, resist the impulse to do so uh, because uh, uh, these common responses block the speaker from moving along their internal journey. You will be able to say whatever you want when it is your turn to be the speaker. If you don't reflect the understanding to the speaker's satisfaction, you, they can always say it again. Then as speaker, you check, do you feel understood to your satisfaction? If you do not feel understood, you can say it again, perhaps in different words. Uh, if you do feel understood, continue sharing. Again, after speaking a bit, pause to give your active listener a chance to recap their understanding of what you said. As the active listener, you again share your understanding of what the speaker said and meant. The cycle of speaking and reflecting continues until you as the speaker do not have anything else you'd like to say or until you get a signal from the timekeeper. Uh, if you get a signal from the timekeeper, then finish up what you're saying in a sentence or two. After you get a final reflection, you can end your turn by saying something like, I feel fully heard, or something like that to indicate you are done with your speaking turn. At that point, the roles uh, then rotate. The active listener becomes the speaker. The person they select becomes the new active listener. For everyone having equal time, it is good to select someone that hasn't spoken lately, but it is your choice. The others in the circle become the silent listeners. This process of turn, taking turns in speaking and active listening continues for whatever time is allotted for the empathy circle. And this was uh, just a very short introduction. The best way to learn the practice is taking part and doing it. Uh, there is more in-depth material on taking part in an empathy circle and facilitating one at empathycircle.com. Thank you for listening.
You're muted, uh, Kathy. Thank you. I said, thank you, Edwin. <laughs> We're now gonna break out into smaller circles for about 90 minutes uh, with four minute turns each. And again, if you uh, want to be recorded, you don't mind that, add an R after your name. If not, if you don't have an R, we will not record you. If you go up into the top right-hand corner of your box, uh, where, you're, where you see your, your face being shown, click on that. It says rename at the bottom. You can just add an R after your name. Uh, so, uh, if you're not gonna be here the entire time, make sure you let your group know up front and be mindful of those who speak English as their second language and speak in short phrases to, pro to provide ease and reflecting. You wanna uh, speak in, in short phrases anyway, and you'll see that uh, modeled as you get into your circle. So the topic today, let me put it in the chat, is share conflicts, mediations, and peace building challenges you are working on. How might the empathy circles help, help in your conflict transformation, mediation, and peace building work? Or you can also talk about whatever is alive for you. That's always an option. So, uh, and then we'll come back to debrief how the circle was for you. And Edwin will tell us next steps after we debrief. So um, Edwin, are you ready to, yeah, so we have uh, one, two, three, four groups. There'll be six people, five to six in a in a circle. And uh, only Bill's group will be that he's going to facilitate. You want to wave, Bill? That's the one group that will be uh, recorded and the other ones will not. And then we have uh, uh, in our group here, we have a room, the second group, uh, Crystal will facilitate, and then uh, Kathy will facilitate the next room, and then uh, Jenna and will facilitate the next, and DJ will be in that. So these are facilitators. And I think we're ready to go. I'm going to stay in the wait room here. Uh, in this room. And if there's any kind of issues, you can just return here, ask me about that. Or if people come late or something, I'll be sort of dealing, uh, working with them yeah. and uh, updating them. So I think we're all set. And here we go into the rooms okay. and enjoy. Let me start that again. Welcome. <laughs> and um, so we have a mixture of people who have done this before. And I think some people who have done it, you know, or this is their first time for the circle. Um, I'll be facilitating. Uh, I have this, uh, you know, the timer. Uh, you'll hear a little harp music uh, when uh, the time is up. Uh, and if you miss that, I have this very expensive handcrafted sign uh that um i just kind of give you you know your heads up when you hear that it does not mean that you have to cut yourself off in the middle of a sentence or anything like that finish your thought and then also you'll get a glass reflection and then we'll move on um I'm, and i'm the facilitator but if i correct you in any way or something like that it's not a criticism of you or your ideas it's just to keep, keep us in the process it's a little bit different um, being an older guy, I liken it to uh, remembering to change the date on my checks in the new year. Um, you know, sometimes I kind of forget that. It's not that I don't know it, what the year is or anything like that, but force of habit. And here, the force of habit is to respond. Um, so most of the corrections are, it's like, oh, I like it. And people are very nice. But, uh, and when it is your turn to speak, you can be just as judgmental, you can agree or disagree or do whatever you want. But as the active listener, it's just you're focusing on reflecting. And this is the difference. And then this creates a, a, a gestalt, a, as we say. Okay. Um, I'll role model the, for being the first uh, listener. 
and I'll just invite one of you to speak. We have four minute turns. Uh, I think you have share conflicts, mediations, peace building challenges you're working on. How might empathy circles help? Um, I guess that would develop. Yeah, Linda, go ahead. Um, could we just introduce ourselves because I'm not familiar with the people here absolutely. and I sort of like to know who I'm talking to? Sure, absolutely, no problem. Okay, I'll start. My name is uh, Bill Filler. Uh, I was a special education teacher for, uh, for about 40 years. Uh, I'm retired right now. I've been working with Edwin in the empathy circles for about five years. Um, Linda? Uh, I'm Linda. I'm a retired school teacher. Uh, I taught middle school and lower grades. Um, I've been doing this off and on for about a year and a half now, and uh, I'm happy to be here. And I'm in I don't know if I said it's Northern California. Okay. Yeah. And if I disappear, it's because I'm having internet go in and out. Right. Yeah. I'm in Northern California too, as is Jonathan, and we are having a lot of rain. So sometimes that might. Mary, could you introduce yourself? Hi. Sorry. I said a little bit at the introduction um, right. previously. But, uh, right. I'm a retired mental health nurse just, just like last year. Um, and it's been tough. Uh, it was a tough go with COVID and in my workplace. So I'm just, I'm, I'm readjusting to uh, my dreams, <laughs> what I really want to do. And uh, I don't know what else I'm supposed to say. That's all right, you, you think about it. <laughs> yeah, welcome, that's great. Um, Matthias? Yeah, hello, my name is Matthias Sieber. I'm calling in from Los Angeles County. We also have a little bit rain down here. Uh, pronouns are he, him. Um, first time in the empathy circle here, so glad to make, uh, glad to meet you all. Um, probably found out about this via LinkedIn via Renata Valerie, who was a, a one of my fabulous professors at California State University, Dominguez Hills, where I got uh, undergrad degree in negotiation, conflict resolution, and peace building. Got my masters from USC in dispute resolution. I was also a peacekeeper in the German army. Um, but professionally, I've been mostly working as a software engineer for over two decades, and now I'm the CEO and co-founder of Lux, and we'll probably hear a little bit about what we're doing later. Sure, great. Welcome. Uh, Tyler? Hi, my name is Tyler. Um, I I do a couple different things. Uh, currently, it's my day job. I work for a BPO company where I do a bunch of uh, training for different launch programs that we have. But on the side, what I'm really passionate about and what I would like to do and develop into the future is XR hyperlearning, which I work with my philosophy professor from uh, UCF, uh, Mark Vagiano, um, who's uh, written some sensational <laughs> uh, papers on empathy um, that I've, I've helped him with. But uh, needless to say, um, I'm located here in Sarasota, Florida. Uh, Got my own thoughts and opinions about that, but, but um, it's warm, so can't complain on that front. But um, uh, one other thing I did want to add is I will have to jump at the top of the hour, unfortunately. Um, but I just wanted to say that up front before uh, that time comes to pass. Great. We'll try to get you in early. Jonathan. Uh my name is uh, Jonathan Gordon. Uh, I'm here in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, and I'm interested in, in applying uh, reflective communication uh, to uh, building community uh, in uh, Vallejo, California. Great. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions, uh, concerns before we get started? Okay. Um, so I'll be the first listener and, uh, who would like to speak first? Only four minutes. Okay. Yeah, Jonathan, thank you. I hope my connection is stable. Uh, can everyone hear me clearly? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, I uh, really appreciate putting a frame around my activism. And the frame I put around is my uh, city, uh, the community. Uh, bounding and giving a 
uh, a target or a playground space or a, uh, a, a group of people and buildings and ideas and processes and traditions uh, gives me a focus as to where I'm going to bring my ideas about empathy to. Uh, one of the projects that's really exciting me uh, is inventorying the schools uh, in Vallejo and working on possibly bringing uh, empathy circles into the schools. Okay. So you were talking about what's been helpful for you and your activism is sort of like framing it and kind of uh, organizing your, your energies. And uh, specifically, one of the things that you're working on is inventorying um, the schools in Vallejo and, and seeing if you could bring empathy circles, uh, empathy circle practice into the schools. And I might have missed something. So please correct me. If I'm wrong. Oh, no, that was a good reflection. Uh, the um, what I hear among everyone I'm listening to uh, is a, a, a great conceptualizing, but not a lot of talk about doing things. Mm -hmm. Right. And so one of the things you've heard is a, a lot of um, conceptualizing, but not a, a specific actions. Yes. And by focusing my activism on the city I live in uh, and being familiar with a lot of the institutions uh, in the city, uh, it allows me um, an audience uh, to talk about reflective listening. Um, and most importantly, uh, uh, I think I've, be, I've become a better listener. Yeah. So one of the things that um, your local focus helps you do is because you are local, there's a many, many ways you can respond in person. You could talk to people and things like that. So that um, bring a focus for your activism. And then also, um, and not insignificantly, the practice, even as you're going on, has made you a better listener. And in closing, I want to share this. Uh, I also work in the healthcare profession. And one of the um, uh, caregivers I work with uh, was struggling over a change in process. And I, I really appreciate the training I've had gotten from the classes here because I was able to listen um, sufficiently enough to make her, her feel better. But in walking away, she said something that struck me. She said, Thank you so much for listening to me. Yeah. And that was really a validation. Sure. So you uh, supervise a bunch of caregivers and there was a change in procedures. And this one person, one of the people that <clears throat> you supervise was feeling uncomfortable or didn't understand it. And so you brought the uh, listening, the reflective listening skills to that. And um, so you really felt that that was effective and the confirmation of that was that as she was walking away she said thank you for listening and that was validation for this particular process thank you i i feel fully heard okay all right um so matthias uh usually we would um you know wait a little bit but i know that you have to leave so i wanted to give you a chance if you feel ready to listen then and reflect you could try it and then you have a chance to speak i just want to make sure you got it a chance to experience it before you left i th thank you i think it was tyler who had to leave on top of the hour oh tyler i'm sorry yeah, um, yeah. no worries all right. so all right so ignore what i said and then insert tyler for <laughs> matthias <laughs> sorry okay oh, um, do you feel ready to um listen or would you like a little bit more time Yes, I feel ready to listen. Okay, great. All right. Um, okay. Well, um, let's see. In my uh, in my time working with um, Edwin, it was also pre-pandemic, um, and uh, so we also went to demonstrations, both on the political left and the political right. Uh, that were happening here in Northern California um, to try to get the both sides to listen to each other. I'll stop there.
Great. So uh, you, you worked with Edwin pre-pandemic and you attended both demonstrations for the political left and the political right to try and uh, figure out a way to bridge the two to uh, come to a, a, a peaceful discussion. Yeah, uh, and, or at least to listen to each other. It's very difficult, as you imagine, things, emotions are very charged, highly charged. Um, and you don't go to a demonstration necessarily thinking, oh, I'd really like to be listened to. I mean, you do in the way of, in a broad sense, but um, in a highly emotionally charged uh, situation, um, it was a real test of listening. I'll stop there. Right. I, I, I completely hear you on that. Um, I, I completely agree. I mean, you can see it just about in any news clip that you find. Um, you know, you, I mean, of course, news clips are always going to post the more, more polarized mm -hmm. fashions of these expressions, but there, there's a lot of uh, emotion that goes into it and people aren't often going there to feel hurt, but ultimately that's what they're trying to, to accomplish. Okay. Um, and so uh, one of the things that I noticed um, is that um, when people came, uh, and especially, you know, people who particularly, you know, uh, are on the opposite end of the political spectrum than I am, when you start to li um, listen, um, then a lot of that defensiveness and other sort of stuff kind of melts away. And so you don't see uh, the other person as a label, blue, red, whatever. Um, but you see them as a human being with nuances and, and has needs just like you. I'll stop there. I, I understand that the, the conditions often that people experience lead to what they, they ultimately believe or follow. And so when we stop and, and listen to them, no matter how opposing they may be, we can start to gain a sense of where they're coming from. And instead of, you know, trying to walk in their shoes from our perspective, we walk in their shoes from their perspective. Yeah, and that, and that really tends to diffuse things. And I've had very, um, you know, uh, touching, you know, examples of people I disagree with politically, but as human beings, um, we're both human beings. I'll stop there. Yes, um, it, sometimes, you know, individuals don't often see eye to eye and we can still see the human being that is within them regardless of what they ultimately feel about certain things sure and just quickly in in summation uh, or in conclusion i wanted to respond to mary because the first um uh, facilitation training we did was at the be very beginning of the pandemic with uh, uh, doctors and nurses and uh, other medical personnel in Brooklyn, New York, at the epicenter. And what they found um, at the you know after the training is that just five minutes <laughs> of reflective listening, say at a shift change, really helped them throughout their day, um, just to be heard. And I'll stop there, and that's the end of my time. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Just reflect so, that, then it's your turn. So I, I can definitely see how giving people the opportunity to voice their concerns can bring some alleviation to it, because often people aren't looking for a, a solution to be provided. They often just want to be heard. And so realistically, that that's that's how we can help heal individuals with things that are beyond our control. Great. Thank you, Tyler. I feel fully heard and it's your turn to speak. Please pick a listener and then off you go. Uh, just going to go with the top. I'll call on Mary. So um, I, I, when I was in school, I was studying pre-medicine um, and a lot of the interactions that I had with whether it be students or professionals in the field, <clears throat> excuse me, in the field, it, it didn't feel like it was a healing environment all the time. Mm -hmm. Granted, the individuals had this knowledge and this, this know-how and how to cure these ailments. There wasn't a, a cure that they were providing for the fundamental human connection. 
and I'll pause there. So in your, um, please bear with me, Tyler, I'm not uh, the expert on this, but in your training, from what I heard from what you said, is that in your training as a doctor, that uh, the that you didn't feel that there was enough of a human connection with all the knowledge that you were learning and, and sharing and, and gaining, there wasn't knowledge around how to make that human connection. Is that correct? Or? Yes, yes. Um, it, it, there's always one particular experience that uh, comes to mind. Um, I won't go into detail on it, but it, it essentially, you know, when when patients voice their concerns to pro medical professionals who have the know-how and the medical professionals, you know, regardless of what's occurring on in their personal lives, you know, if they can't, you know, make that connection with the patient and deliver a, a meaningful connection and almost assure them of what it is that they are telling them, you know, it, it, it does little for, for their mental sanity and their mental health as, as they go through and, and proceed with getting the treatment that they need. And I'll pause there. So you found that um, in your experience as a as a, um, a a student that in learning and watching and observing the I, maybe I'm putting words into here. Sorry. Um, in your experience, you found that um, there wasn't um, with the physicians or with them, I'm guessing with the, the doctors who are in charge of the patient's care, you didn't feel that there was um a, the doctor was helping um to understand where the patient was coming from on a mental health um well in 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 their experiences um there wasn't a connection between the the patient and the doctor with regards to how to cope with the illness or how to even process it or even just to talk about it I maybe yes. put some stuff in there. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. Uh, so yes, uh, and that's part of it. That the real idea is that you know, as a medical professional, we're the, we're we're there to heal individuals, people who have aren't necessarily sure about what is going on with them or what is going to be needed to help treat what's going on with them. And so it, it's a, as a medical professional, it's almost an obligation to relate that human level because it, I, I, in my opinion, that is part of it. And ultimately it led me astray from the, the course pursuing, uh, you know, a degree in medicine uh, because I ultimately saw a bigger problem within the medical field that needed to be tackled, which was, you know, teaching medical employees and staff on how to be more empathic in their relationships with not just the patients, but with each other as well. Um, you know, studies have shown that there's a lot of, um, a lot of disagreement for lack of a better term uh, that goes on even amongst the, the staffs that are employed in health clinics and health facilities. But the real issue there is that, you know, they don't see that there's a need for that. And I'll, I'll stop there. So, um, I mean, you're hitting on a huge nerve here with me because I'm completely with you on this. Um, seen it thousands of times. It's there's, there isn't, you found that you, you really lost your way and uh, not lost your way, but you really fell out of, um, um, connection with, um, your medical practice because there, there was a, this feeling of, uh, lack of connection between, the, the patient and the, um, the physician, the healer, um, in a sense that was not, um, not helping and not helpful. And that you, you felt that there was a bigger need and, and, and you felt that you feel that there's definitely like a, um, a need for this in a, in a huge way. I'm probably wasn't listening at the very end, or I was kind of falling away at the end, but, um, 100% agree with you that there's that this is lacking and um uh each person each and even within the system itself there's a lot of disagreements and a lot of arguments around you know what should and shouldn't be done and how how this should be approached and uh um I'm not sure if I got it all I'm sorry Tyler did well, I do any justice I, I think you did I think you did thank you Mary I feel fully heard yeah thank you 
Mary, it's your turn to speak. Pick a listen. Okay, I'll take, uh, okay, let's see, Matthias. Hi. Um, so like Tyler, I could totally, totally get what you're saying, um, 100%. Um, like I said, I'm going through a big transition right now, physically, emotionally, and it's rough. It's really tough. Um, I worked in an acute care mental health facility and it was just, there was too much violence, too much aggression for me over time. It just really took a toll on my uh, physical health. So I'm looking after a lot of stuff now and my mental health as well. So I'll just stop there. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. So you worked in a position of acute mental health support where you uh, faced uh, high levels of violence and aggression. And because it took a heavy toll on you, you are currently in a physical and emotional transition, uh, being proactive, taking care of yourself. Did I hear that right? Yes. Uh, and Tyler, I just wanted to give you a huge thumbs up for your bravery in um in in what you're doing, what your what your plan is for your future, um, in wanting to change the system, um, it would be fantastic. <laughs> um, I used to have a saying because uh, you know you'd always run into people, in in work. Some of the, I mean, we we had to work for the physicians basically, as for the patients, but as well as for the physician. And I oftentimes found it difficult to um, try to advocate for a patient when the physician doesn't care. So what I kind of came up with in my early years was I just learned that there are doctors who are have their pers their persons first and they have personalities. So <clears throat> that lends to how they care or don't care for their patients. So um, I would really learn how to figure out who the good personalities were and <laughs> and where I could go for if I needed help or assistance. And I'll stop there. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I heard uh, you gave Tyler kudos for wanting to change the system. Um, and it was interesting for me to hear, even though you I think you try to be diplomatic. What I heard was that re really you worked for physicians uh, primarily and patients secondarily. So you learned that doctors like our humans, they have personalities. Some care a little bit more about patients. Some care a little bit less about patients. And you really had to navigate a system and looking for, okay, who can I associate myself with if I needed help? I'm not sure about the last part, but. Yeah, well, that's good. That's good. I, I, I feel her. I'm not, not sure how much longer I have, but um, near, uh, during COVID, um, it became a, a real war zone around rules and, and whatnot. And it was just, uh, I think, Bill, you were talking about how just being heard at the end of a shift, like, there was just no no hearing us it was horrible um and the anxiety around you know everything the deaths and the diagnoses and all that kind of stuff was just ridiculous um so i i really want to um and i want to... okay good no, okay. keep on going you don't have to cut yourself off go ahead finish up uh, I, I just like i said it before i really want to um explore other like other interests that i have like writing and drawing and stuff like that to to you know get this all out of my system basically and and heal and i don't know if i could help somebody else in the process but sure. yeah thank you i would love to hear more about that but um so you pointed out that, and we can only try to imagine. So thank you very much for sharing that. And I hope this has not been re-traumatizing, really but COVID was really a war zone for you around rules and it brought high levels of anxiety and uh, which is still not 
fully being uh, processed, um, pro partially probably because or partially because you were not being heard at the end of a shift, for example, right? Where you decompress and, you know, let it all go. And that did not happen. So you're looking to, again, be proactive and changing and, and dealing with, with this and healing through writing and uh, drawing and uh, do that work to, to fully heal and make that transition. Thank you, I feel fully heard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. All right. I think it is my turn. Yes. So I would like to call on Linda to be listening. Um, so when I was working as a software engineer, there was, I believe, in early 2017, there was a lunch break. I was like always sitting at my computer. And somehow I was watching YouTube while eating my lunch and I got an odd recommendation. It was a lecture recording from UC Berkeley, Introduction to Nonviolence. And, and so I started listening to the lecture and there was a whole course and I kept on over the, the next days and weeks, I kept on listening to those lectures and I learned about uh, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, of course, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., learned about history there. But I also learned a ton about uh, not necessarily what my ancestors, I'm a German citizen, what atrocities my ancestors did in the last century. I know plenty of that due to the school system. But also nonviolent movements that actually resulted in the liberation of people that would have otherwise gone to concentration camps. And that was very powerful for me. Okay, let me see if I can get all this. Um, it was 2017. It was lunchtime. You were at work. Uh, you were... Um, some sort of software engineer, I believe you said, and you're watching YouTube and it was uh, about nonviolence and um, you, uh, it caught your attention. You really were interested in it. So you continued to um, watch it and um, you learned from it and you learned about Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King. And it made you think about um, things that, you had learned through um, your childhood or upbringing about the atrocities that um, people had done to uh, others. And um, you, uh, I missed, I didn't quite get the end of it, but it was something about reaching, reaching people that probably wouldn't have been reached before. That that's right. The the impactful moment there was really that you know nonviolence even worked in Nazi Germany. So that got me really interested. And long story short, um, I enrolled in college, got my GED. That's not important, but the important part is that I attended a university, and I learned about. Uh, mediation, arbitration, peace building, negotiation, et cetera, yada, yada, yada. But also what I was doing as a peacekeeper, I was in the division for special forces in the German army in 2001 and 2002 in the former Yugoslav Republic of North Macedonia. There was a little bit of name change uh, throughout uh, because in 2001, a civil war, the civil war in you know, from from all the region in the Balkans finally arrived in Macedonia. But as a grunt, actually, that's that's not only applicable to the military. In many organizations, you don't know what the mission is, what the vision is, what the hell am I doing here? So I learned about that actually in academia. What was the conflict about? Okay, um, you uh, went on to to 
learn about mediation and uh you were a peacekeeper in i believe the army you said or something like that and um i just got so wrapped up in your story um i totally just i can't it's just like sitting here um you you you've used the mediation and things in your work and i'm sorry i forgot that's all right uh i am practicing my storytelling so i'm glad i got you so wrapped up in this <laughs> um so in north macedonia i was there as a peacekeeper i did not use mediation at that time what i learned though in academia that my presence as a soldier uh on this nato mission certainly had a tiny role in the overall peace building process. But what I learned is actually that the civil war was essentially uh, put to an end due to a successful mediation. And the interesting part is that the whole region, right, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Kosovo, where also was stationed, Macedonia, uh, Croatia, right, all these countries of the former Yugoslav Republic are now a lot more peaceful than, let's say, the U.S., and they have been over the last decade. So I really learned there that mediation was what drove the overall peace process, and that was really powerful. Okay, I'm going to sum this up. Um, what you learned was um, that to... Um, what brought resolution, so to speak, to to the, this war was was mediation, and you uh, feel that uh, the countries that were involved in these different wars in the Balkans, and things like that, um, are more peaceful than the United States because they do practice in some way um, mediation. Um, and they are probably editorializing here. I know I shouldn't. Probably nicer places, safer places, or nicer places to live because they do have mediation, and it is from what I'm part of their part of what they do. Yes, thank you. That's I right. That I feel right. fully heard. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Oh. Bill, you can listen to me. Sure, happy to. Okay, after all of this very heady uh, listening uh, and hearing these things, I am going to share something that is happy. Okay, so um, after listening to a lot of uh, really heavy stuff, you're going to kind of lighten the mood a bit. Last night I was watching the news, Nora O'Donnell, loved the woman, and, and they did their um, on the road segment, and Fridays is always a really fun one. So you were listening, uh, watching TV, Nora O'Donnell is one of your favorite reporters, and they did a fun on the road segment. Um, I don't remember what state, but it was a Southern state uh, or Southeastern. Um, there was a school and uh, in this school, there were uh, some children that had disabilities. They were in wheelchairs and things like that. And the kids, other kids went to their teacher one day and said, this isn't fair. We have all this playground equipment, but they named the kids, can't, can't play. What can we do about it? So in the report, they were looking at a school, I think you said, in the southeast somewhere, and it was for kids with disability. And they had a very, um, and some of the kids um, he came and said, look, we have all this playground equipment, but these kids with the disabilities can't use it. What can we do about it? Yeah, and so the, they, they brainstormed and they thought about the equipment, and it was going to cost $300,000. And that's a lot of money. And so the kids started collecting coins, bake sales, 
garage sales. And then, now these are fifth graders. They started getting on the phone and contacting businesses. They went to restaurants and did the share thing where they you know, donate a percentage. End of this part of the story is they hit their goal of $300,000 in about two and a half months. Wow. So um, the kids were very resourceful, fifth graders, um, and they did the usual bake sales and other things like that and saving their pennies. But um, they really reached out to businesses and other things and restaurants, and they were able to um, reach their um, goal in about, what, I think, two and a half months or something. Yeah. Um, they don't have the playground equipment yet because they showed the kids and it means like lots and lots of snow. Um, and they showed the, the three kids that were part of the handicap, the three in, in, in the wheelchair. Us and oh god they were so cute but this they interviewed this this one boy and this is just totally broke my heart i mean i was in tears he said it's not about the equipment it's about that they cared about us yeah so they didn't have the equipment up i think they said they were snowing or something in other words they hadn't had um put the equipment in um but in uh, what really touched you is there was a boy one of the disabled boys and he said it's not about the equipment it's but it's that they they really cared about us yeah it was just it was really touching so the teacher in a room and i think if you've ever been in a classroom you or in front of a firehouse or something with fundraising, they have this big thing with like a thermometer or something. And they had this in their room for a hundred thousand dollars. But then they we went back to the room and it went up and across the ceiling. Their goal now is to raise seven hundred thousand dollars so that they can put this equipment in all the schools. Because apparently wherever this town is, they have many disabled um people students in the schools it wasn't just this one school so now they're out to raise seven hundred thousand dollars so now um well um they had a and i get believe is a, a closed captioning uh system for the kids was that it yeah that went across and not only on the board but across the ceiling and so um, they felt that this was not only a good idea for this particular school, but th I guess throughout the whole school district. So now they are uh, campaigning to raise $700,000 in order to install it district wide. Yeah, and I just, um, it gave me hope for, for the future generations. I just, like I said, I had tears streaming down my face and so did my roommate. It was just like, I was just so amazed because so many times I think, that's our future and now I can think that's our future yes and I feel fully heard and listened to sure and I just to say is that yeah and you were in tears as you was your roommate and it really gave you a lot of hope for the future great okay uh Tyler we're almost at the top of the hour I don't know if you have uh to leave um you know, on the spot or whether you want to have a chance to uh, listen and talk one more time. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to have to drop right on the spot, but uh, I do want to say I, I thank you everyone for, you know, providing me the opportunity to share, but also the opportunity to listen. I thought this was very impactful, um, at least um, for me. Um, and I, I hope to see everybody again in, in the future. Great. Well, future. welcome and welcome back when you come. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, I'll talk to uh, Mary. Yes. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, there are some, definitely some, uh, some really hopeful things that are going on. And, um, and what I have learned uh, in these circles is that um, uh, in, in the philosophical debate as to whether we are, as human beings are essentially good, or essentially there's a thin veneer of civilization over a savage beast, um, 
I find that um, we actually uh, are more empathic. I'll stop there. Okay, so you find that there's um, a lot of hopeful things uh, going on and um, um, that uh, regardless of us being human beings, uh, sorry, um, so the fact that we're human beings um, with with a thin veneer of, you know, a, a, um, evil, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> um, the, the, the bad side of us that in general, we are good, we're good people. Yeah, in the debate of whether we're just really essentially evil, just, um, and I think that, um, that, uh, you know, evolution um, really uh, supports the, the point of view of human collaboration um, for as various iterations, we've been around for about 3 million years. But for most of that time, we were not the top animal. <laughs> and so therefore, in order to survive, we had to cooperate. And so I believe that that is what is ingrained in our DNA. And when we see people do horrible things, it's not because that's their essential nature, but because they haven't received or experienced that sort of collaboration. And so therefore they're acting out. I'll stop there. So, um, so you find that uh, human beings, um, in order to cooperate, because, because we weren't always the top top dog that mm -hmm. now now that we are um the way that we got there was by through collaboration mm -hmm. and you find that um um that that's very very key to our survival is that we we collaborate yeah and the other point is that when we do act out in horrible ways with which we have um it's because we haven't experienced that it, it, it it's actually a reaction to not having experienced that Right. And the, and the lack of the lack of experience of collaboration, um, you see that in, in people who act out or or people who are not not acting in, a, in, a, in an empathic manner, but they're they're acting from a place of lack, lack of of um, collaboration. Yes. And I have personal experience as a special education teacher I worked with in kids and families in extreme crisis. And so um, periodically um, the, the students were prone to, you know, violent acts, throwing, a, it would seem to be impulsive. But um, so I'll stop there. And then I'll give so, so you've um, seen families in extreme crisis and you've seen kids reacting quite impulsively. Um, yeah. And what I learned is that afterwards, we would ask this central question, what was the communicative intent of that act? And when we did our research, we found that they weren't fed, they saw a violent act or something like that. And when we could address that, and they felt listened to, the violence went down. So in your experience of uh, analyzing and discussing and and taking apart with the child or whoever it was that was acting out sorry you're working with children so the the violent act was addressed in in, in a in a way that not punitive but in, inquiring what brought on the the um the violence and once you found out you know it could be it could be that they were hungry it could be you know something minor like that 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 once their concern or their issue was addressed that the violence stopped thank you mary i feel fully heard you're welcome uh, okay i'll pick jonathan yeah so this is this is quite uh draining for me um emotionally because it is bringing up a lot of um like your bill you were just talking about violent kids and stuff like that and 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 addressing the the basic needs and for me uh I'll you're, stop. Fi you're finding uh the conversation uh you know personally uh bringing up memories and uh of your uh distress uh in similar circumstances yeah i found it um hospital system was just slow enough at, at providing support to people who were in crisis. Uh, you, you found that 
you were when you were in the hospital working, uh, your observation was that it distressed you because the hospital was so slow in uh, satisfying uh, or addressing problems. Well, it was my experience that they they didn't know what to do. <laughs> Literally didn't know what to do. You're really stating that the competence of the professionals is in doubt because they just didn't know what to do. Or, or they didn't want to spend the money. Like we had a recreation budget that was like pennies, literally. They would not provide crayons. There was not activities for people to do. And meanwhile, they have taken the time to have a police officer pick up a patient, restrain them, handcuff them and bring them to hospital, put them on a form and lock them up and yet provide no activities, bare minimum activities for them to cope once they got in, in, in the hospital. Your attention focused on this stark and horrible contrast, how lots of money is put into uh, uh, restraint uh, and no money is put into prevention. Yeah, and care. And mm -hmm. care. Yeah, and, and, and cure and healing. Uh, so I used to spend a lot of time talking to people and trying to, you know, get a handle on how, how best to direct them in their, I would like to call it like a Colombian jail, basically, <laughs> you know, like hard rock floors and, and, and guards and threats. And it was just, to me, felt very, uh, it's like very archaic. There isn't a lot of negotiation going on. There's not a lot of empathy going on with the patients. It's either you take the medications and accept this care or uh, you get locked up and tied up and stay here forever, or whatever. It's just. Uh... You're saying in the course of a daily day of work, uh... Your things are almost approached uh, uh, as if you were in a prison in a third world. Uh, your interactions with coworkers and staff tended to be about how to pass messages and deal with the guards and how to uh, survive uh, just to get through the day. Um, sorry, not not about the so my my discussions with my colleagues or my coworkers. Um, it was different. There's there's the physicians who would dictate, and then uh, like not a lot of people would um, would stand up for the patients. And if they did, um, and there was just a lot of like competition around who's the better nurse, as opposed to you know what are we doing for these people. It was just I don't know. I call it hell on earth. <laughs> Sorry. So, so you're saying there's no 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 camaraderieship, uh, no uh, cooperation among staff, no empathy, no uh, just a very horrible uh, working environment. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yes, I feel really hard. Thank you. Okay. Great. Well, thank you. Um, Matthias, would you uh, respond? I would love to. Uh, well, I've been listening to the conversation and I was thinking back to my younger days uh, when I was bartending uh, in a mafia bar in San Pablo and hanging out with a criminal element. Okay, that took me by surprise. So, <laughs> so I hear you. You are now, ref or mentally, at a point in time when you were younger, and you were a bartender in a mafia bar, and you were hanging out with a clientele that uh, most people usually, at least not knowingly, would interact with. Uh, yes. And I really didn't understand uh, or begin to understand narcissism and uh, sociopathy and psychopathy until I entered the uh, healthcare business and had to manage. And I've worked with about 40 caregivers. 
Okay. Um, so you were bartending, but you did not learn about or experienced narcissism, sociopathy, and psychopathy until you worked with about 40 or so care, was it caretakers or caregivers? Caregivers. Caregivers. Having a little internet problem. I'm not sure where it is. Uh, so what I've found by uh, supervising caregivers uh, is some of the best caregivers are extremely narcissistic. <laughs> okay. So you learned that the best caregivers are a little bit narcissistic and you experienced that or you observed that as a supervisor. Yes, uh, their success stems from their controlling uh, uh, nature and their wanting to dominate the situation. And so they make a perfect uh, instrument for assisting, for example, uh, an Alzheimer's or a dementia patient, because they are very good at ordering people around. Okay, so... Um, I hear that Alzheimer's and dementia patient might benefit from, from someone who is very controlling and dominating and uh, somewhat narcissistic uh, caregivers fit that profile. Uh, yeah, my sound is going in and out. Uh, but continuing... Uh, now, what, what becomes interesting is that my relationships with these individuals has improved because by doing a lot of empathy circles, I've learned to listen better. In other words, and one of the hardest things I've had to learn uh, is expressions. Uh, in other words, if I contort my face and give away my reaction to whatever they're saying, it... Uh, triggers them and it's almost as bad as uh saying something okay so you learned through the empathy circle that expressions matter a lot in the interaction with these individuals now i'm not entirely sure if the individuals refer to the caregivers or the alzheimer's dementia patients i would assume the caregivers i'm talking 100 percent caregivers <laughs> Um, now, what's interesting, I've tried a few uh, reflection sessions, and I had one go ballistic on me, and uh, we had to fire her. All right, so I hear that uh, one uh, person that you interacted with uh, went absolutely ballistic on you, and as a consequence, uh, that individual had to be let go. Anyway, I, I feel fully heard. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That was a, a very uh, interesting story, and I would have loved to hear, hear more. I hope I am not causing uh, too much uh, lag here. But uh, since it's my turn again, Linder, would you feel okay with uh, dealing with me again? <laughs> sure. All right, wonderful. So um, moving on, so I'm at CSUDH, right? Learned that mediation is powerful. And I really began to, like, I, I was a fully convert, right? I, I drank the Kool-Aid, you know, I signed up to the cult, you know, I joined the brotherhood, sisterhood. Uh, what is a more gender neutral term? note for myself anyway so i really felt that the a and adr right an alternative dispute resolution should really stand for appropriate so appropriate dispute resolution um okay um you sort of fit it out there but um you were talking about mediation and uh an appropriate uh solution all right Absolutely. It's not an alternative. It's an appropriate solution. It should be the default. So at uh, my university, unfortunately, 
nobody mentioned or you know highlighted that at least in the US, uh, normally mediators also have to learn how to run their own business. Okay, no one ever mentioned to you, especially in the US, that mediators have to learn to run their own business. Right, and that was really a problem because the way independent mediators advertise themselves, for example, on social media, really introduces a bias. Um, and from what you've seen, um, the way that uh, mediators introduce themselves, on, like on the internet or advertise, um, creates a bias. That is right. Um, so when I graduated um, and uh, continued my education, I was still working on the side as a software engineer. That's actually not important. But in November 2021, I uh, co-founded my company, Lox Inc., uh, to build platforms that essentially match ADR specialists with paying customers. OK, when you're going to school, you're still working as a software programmer, engineer, whatever. And um, you created your own business um, that matched I'm not sure what the initials you used were um, with, uh, did you say companies or clients? I'm not sure. Uh, clients, but that's a wonderful segue because uh, actually what we're focusing on in 2023 as a company that we are actually looking for small to mid-sized organizations like uh, corporations, innovative corporations. So we can, you know, match ADR specialists like transformative mediators, for example, with uh, paying customers. Okay, one of your goals for 2023 is to um, match ADRs with um, um, paying customers and clients, small business corp, small, small corporations is what you're going after. That is that is right. Yeah. So actually, last year we had a proof of concept mediators.ai. Um, it uses some fancy blockchain technology. Maybe Tyler would have been interested in that. But uh, essentially, the goal is really to bring down the average turnaround time, right? Because if you you know the process, even pre-COVID, we had a situation where. On average in the US, if parties already knew about mediation, which is a whole nother topic, uh, decided that they want to mediate, right? Uh, deciding on a mediator, they would go like to a website, a early 2000 style website directory kind of listing. It's, for example, the Southern California Mediation Association and they will go one by one, hey, do you mediate this client? What's your availability? What's your rate, et cetera, right? So that's very problematic. And we reduced that turnaround time significantly to under a week. And I'll stop there. One of the most problematic things in hooking up people with the mediators is um, the turnaround time. Uh, and you are uh, bringing that down to something more manageable. Just be because people would have to go and look up, look it up and then investigate themselves, make the calls. But your uh, company uh, has found a way to bridge that and assist these, these clients to, to get mediated. Is that a word? Mediated? It is now. <laughs> it, it is now. We, we use it all the time. So yeah, thank you. I feel fully, fully heard, fully listened to. Thank you. And thank you, Jonathan, uh, for the uh, pointing that out. Um, Mary, would you be my listener? Definitely, yes. Okay, no clue what I'm talking about right now, but I'll <laughs> give it a shot. Um, we were talking about, oh, you were talking, was it you or Jonathan? Oh, one of you two, because yeah. you're both sort of like in the same field, talking about narcissists and um, people that are single-minded and their way or the highway. Try working with teachers. Mm -hmm. 
they are probably the worst as far as my way yeah. is the right way. There's nothing else. So, okay. So you're, you're reflecting on, um, Jonathan and, and my, uh, my, our sharing and that you can, you can, uh, you know, you, Jonathan, uh, brought up nar- the narcissist and I'm sorry, but I couldn't stop laughing. It was hilarious. <laughs> I don't know if you meant it in a, in a funny way, but it definitely came across. Um, sorry. So, so Linda, you were picking up on that narcissistic uh, personality type of person. And you're saying, try working with uh, teachers um, with narcissistic personality. Just you'll get your full. <laughs> Part of the problem with teaching is it's probably the loneliest profession because you may run amongst your your peers in the morning grabbing coffee copy machine whatever but once that bell rings you are totally isolated with your children basically for the rest of the day because most teachers are copying or working through lunch or making phone calls whatever so basically it's you and these little people for six and a half seven hours a day and it is gets terrifying at times <laughs> so uh the coffee is the the key point there so <laughs> when you're <laughs> when you're in between copying and doing the coffee and then you're running back into your class you're you when you're in the class you're basically alone you're on your own and it can be terrifying um yeah it just because if you think about it, you have these little people or not so little people. Oh, that's a cat's tail. Bill, you're confusing me. Um, um, because something can go wrong like this and uh, just like you can in a medical facility. But mm-hmm. at least there may be other people around you, but in a classroom, it's you and the emergency. Yeah. So um, being in a being in a classroom with um, you know a whole classroom full of little little people <laughs> that uh, may have a medical emergency, you don't have backup, and so that's terrifying. I, I can't imagine. I'm sorry. I just uh, I can't imagine how it must feel for you. Sorry. Now that's one thing I did with my students, whether they were the second graders or the seventh and eighth graders, I would teach them that, uh, because I had some health problems, blood pressure, that sort of thing. I would teach them that if I tell you to get your things and go to Mr. Boyce's room, you do it, or you go get some, you know, they would know to follow my directions and they would know what it was something that they should be aware of. But um, they knew how to do these things, which was great because it did work. But they also knew because um, I was in a portable that was about a block away from the main office and help. Um, but they also, those little kids could run, knew to run, but they also could go next door and grab a teacher or something like that. And it teaches them flexibility and responsibility. So in your experiences with being in a, in a, in a, what are those things called? A portable miles away from the school and any kind of, uh, any kind of emergency supports, you had to teach the children and it's still into the children that you run for help. And when I asked you to listen, to go for help, they would listen to you and they would go and they would know that it is an emergency. So you felt that um, you, the kids were there basically backing you up as an, as an adult to, to, to be there in a medical emergency. Yeah, just one more little thing. Um, I would always tell my kids, don't tell me anything. Come whining to me unless there's bone sticking out or gushing blood. (laughs) And I was standing on a desk doing something on the wall and I sort of twisted and slipped and I turned to my kids and I go, you have nothing to say? And little Uh Joey, I still remember little Joey. He goes, but Mrs. Jones, you told us only if it's gushing blood or bone sticking (laughs) out. And it was like, damn, they did listen. Mm-hmm. So, so it kind of backfired on you a little bit where uh, you told them, don't tell you anything unless it's a bone sticking out or gushing blood. So basically near death. 
and uh, that you yourself ended up twisting your ankle and got it kind of thrown back at you that, uh, yeah, well, you told us, you know, we're not running. <laughs> uh, thank you. I feel fully hurt. <laughs> That's an amazing story. Yeah, and I, I, I really empathize with your, your experiences. So do I, thank do you. I, talk again? I yep. mm -hmm. talk again? okay, so maybe I need to lighten it up a little bit and I'm feeling like I'm <laughs> everybody down. It, it's true when when I get talking about work it's like uh, I go down this rabbit hole and it's like oh there's a dark darkness at the end there and there's no wind no wind out so yeah so um oh my god what do I say pick a listener pick a listener first oh shoot uh uh Matthias I'll pick you again um so In my rumbles in life, it hasn't been all that dark and drab. I, I believe that I, I may have shone the light for some people. Um, and so I need to really do that for myself. I need to turn that around on, on to me. Um, being in that system, though, where Jonathan was talking about narcissists, uh, I could not get out from underneath a lot of the narcissists at work and that partly like this group is amazing because being around other human beings who do listen <laughs> might open my heart a little bit because um I was it was pretty knocked down by uh by the the lack of ears the lack of of heart uh and soul there I mean there there were definitely people with hearts and souls but they weren't um it wasn't like that's why they were there. They were there for the money, which is really sickening. So, um, yeah, thank you for sharing again. Um, so what I hear is that you understand that, you know, it is up to you. You're very, you, you're being proactive right now, right? Uh, however, you point out that you've been influenced by the narcissists in your, your work. Um, at the same time, you really feel empowered by this listening community. Yeah, uh, thanks for listening. Um, so I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know where I'm going to go from here. Um, part of me just wants to get a knapsack on my back and just go and travel the world and just forget about everything. Um, because it can it can get to be too much. Uh, so I hear that you have you are aware of all the opportunities that you have right where do you go from here there's plenty of opportunity and one opportunity is to just travel the world you know focus on other things forget about you know your your prior experiences for a while yeah that would be nice um because yeah, there's just too much pain there's a lot of pain in my head and in and uh my body so I, I tend to take things in too much and absorb them <laughs> and uh yeah so I need to let go a little bit more anyways um so I'm drawing more I love to draw so I'm doing that uh it's dark up here in Toronto I don't know about you guys but this darkness is just hell. I have my my light, my satellite, my D3. It's a bit of sunshine out there, so I might go for a walk. Um, just doing a lot of self-care, I guess. Um, this is part of it, and I really appreciate being here. And sorry I didn't mean to bring everybody down about my... I, I don't know if anybody else has watched Echo 3 on Apple. It's about a Colombian prison. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and once once the woman escapes, she wants to go back. Holy Lord. <laughs> so I don't want to okay. do that. Yeah. 
All right. So uh, first of all, uh, you share a fear that you bring others down. Um, you also acknowledge you also acknowledge that you know. I, I hear that you watch this the show where you know uh, a person escapes her prison and then ultimately puts her self back in this miserable situation um you are experiencing pain in your body and head uh, because you take tend to take in a lot and internalize it and you acknowledge for yourself that you need to let go of things um I'm very glad to hear that you are doing more drawing, which you love. So uh, also an editorial comment, do more of that. And uh, you're based in Toronto right now. It's a little bit dark. Uh, I can empathize with that feeling. I grew up in Hamburg, Germany, which is, is I guess, the Seattle of Germany okay. or the Toronto of Germany. Uh, but you you're taking steps right you're again very proactive you do those things you you know you seek light you take vitamin d3 you walk you do self-care part of this is this uh empathy circle this listening circle so you do do more of that which is nice to hear and uh if i may add a comment i hope you can uh, do more of that and let go of the pain more and more you deserve Thanks. it Thank you. I feel forward. Thanks. Okay, so Edwin uh, gave us the 10 minute mark, and so we still have time for one or two more. Um, and so, Mateus, your turn to speak. Pick a listener. All right. Uh, Jonathan, please. Um, I think I, I won't take the, the whole time. That's all right. Um, <laughs> So picking up with, you know, the, the focus of my company, we're trying to attract uh, small to mid-sized uh, organizations to be paying customers. Uh, continuing uh, with discussing your organization, uh, you're trying to attract small and mid-sized businesses, and you dropped out. Oh, okay, that is correct. Having a lot of yeah. trouble. <laughs> Maybe it's between us, but text works. Um, yeah, so a couple of things where we can help with. Uh, there's, I would say, three main areas. The first one is internal mediation, right? If there's disputes within uh, an organization that can be as severe things as sexual harassment, but it can also be uh, things like, hey, we have a problem here, for example, share ownership, especially in startups, co-founders might end up working in various capacities than originally agreed to, and an internal mediation can just solve that conflict. That's the first one. Dropped out again. Ah. So your, your organization provides uh, resources uh, on a number of different levels from uh, on the employee level, employee to employee level, perhaps regarding sexual discrimination or harassment, or on the higher level, which would be uh, resolving uh, uh, disputes between uh, partners uh, that own an organization. That is correct, right? A second area could be then more along the lines of which historically would be taken up by qualified product or project managers. So facilitation of meetings like planning meetings or retrospectives. And the intent there is that people or I guess ADR specialists really bring out more the voices of everyone, right? That everyone gets truly uh, be taken serious, a chance to speak their mind and what's what are the worries, what are the concerns? So those can be surfaced earlier uh, before these issues become a bigger problem. And I'll stop there. 
Um, so you're saying that beyond the obvious uh, intervention to uh, control some ongoing problem, uh, your organization specializes in uh, looking at the system background uh, so that you can put in place additional meetings and uh, requests uh, and opportunities uh, to facilitate communication in order to avoid problems in the future. That is much better phrased than I said it. Yes, absolutely. And the third piece is that um, now bringing uh, mediation services to employees as employee benefit, because to me, it is really important. Um, and this is maybe counteracting what's going on with, you know, cold layoffs and all that stuff that there are organizations that truly care and they can show that by offering employee benefits um, like access to mediation services. So if um, I was an employee at a, a company and I have some family conflict, marital, marital dispute or something like that, landlord tenant, that I can utilize a mediation service such that we provide as well to deal with that so it does not also affect work life that much because it's solved. So I, I, I hear you saying that you, you view your service as almost as essential as uh, the electricity or the water in a business and that businesses uh, uh, efficiency uh, and uh, the employee morale and uh, uh, camaraderie uh, could be enhanced if businesses uh, incorporate uh, mediation um, uh, as, a, a, as a daily occurrence. In other words, why let things get out of control? Let, let's build mediation into the system so that we can um, thwart problems in the future. That's right. I feel fully listened to, fully heard. Thank you. Okay, I'm just... Well, you're, you're certainly very welcome. Okay. I don't know how much uh, time we have. I'm just going to uh, interject quickly. Uh, just because Matthias... Uh, this guy, James Adams, actually came to one of these um, uh, circles uh, about a month ago, and he wrote this book, and he worked with the U.S. military in the same area, the Balkans. Oh, yeah. And so I just wanted to give you that uh, reference. You may know him, or you may know of him, or you might want to contact him, because he seemed to have worked in the same area that you did. Um, okay. Uh, Thank you. Sure. Well, uh, reflect for two minutes for me. Yeah, sure, absolutely. I'm sorry, Jonathan. Just want to make sure I got that in. My apologies, go right ahead. And then maybe we can do a quick recap. Uh, okay. I, I, I it, the, James came to my mind also when uh, the issue of, uh, of uh, global or larger conflict resolution uh, came up. And what struck me or what I took away from that uh, marvelous uh, uh, exposure. By the way, I did buy his book mm -hmm. uh, and read it. Uh, uh, is uh, it, it is the structural complexity that he's dealing with and how he is focused on inordinately large and powerful uh, organizations and forces that are moving and how there are degrees of negotiated peace which rely upon these large forces being still in place and his classification of moving through the stages towards normalization. Uh, my, my focus, as I said in the introduction today, is really working on the grassroots level. And what, I, what helps me in my life is, uh, uh, seeing uh, the local and seeing the global and realizing the incredible complexity to get from one to the other. And I'm going to just relinquish my time because uh, I'd like to hear everybody's uh, summary or kind of like a before we split. Okay, I don't know how much time we'll have here, um, but basically I'll just do a real quick and dirty. Uh, so you uh, bought James Adams' book and read it, and what you were concerned, uh, which would caught your attention, was the difference between these large and complex organizations 
um, and dealing with the layers of these complexities in order to achieve some sort of mediation, some sort of uh, acceptable mediation thing. And I know I didn't do it justice, but uh, I want to leave it open for other people. Oh, you, you read his book, it is so complex. It is complex. <laughs> Thank you. I feel understood. Okay, great. We have 50. I guess we're all leaving. We do a summary on the big room. Sure. Anything else anybody want to have? Or uh, I just I just want to say I think there's so many competing uh, competing um, interests when it comes to trying to trying to make it one one voice. It's there's a lot of personalities and a lot of interests, and finances and stuff like that. It's just can become a big mess. It has to be a one voice, one signal, one like, you know, the idea of empathy, one sort of idea. Great. Anybody else? No, I, I enjoyed this group and I enjoyed meeting you all. Yeah, me too. Uh, well, thank you. Bringing joy. Thanks a lot, everyone. What okay. See you in the big room. Here. So welcome back, everyone. We're going to do a debrief now, and Larry is going to uh, guide us through that. And Larry, do you have the um, the thing to post in the chat, or do you want me to? I just posted it. Great. Over to you, Larry. And then uh, after Larry, Edwin will tell us next steps. All right. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. So um, we would like to take a look at, um, we'll go around the room and have you share your experience of the empathy circle. So take about 30 seconds to share about your experience, any insights and the on the role of empathy in peace building. And I'll just go ar around the room. Um, Crystal, can I start with you please? Whoops, you're on mute. Uh, better listening skills uh, so that we can respond in a coherent uh, manner. Wonderful. Thanks, David. That is a great segue to turn it over to John, who's going to lead us through some of the skills that you mentioned. I don't yeah, somebody's got another to... call open. I don't know who that is, but. Uh... Oh, we're... Just right where you are. Somebody mute themselves. Okay, it was Linda. Okay. I just muted her. Thank you, Larry. I just want to say what a pleasure it was um, being in a circle with you um, and our group. And it was my first time facilitating. And we had more of an open circle. And um, I was trying to honor Edwin's process and then meet the needs of the people in our room. And it was beautiful to see people step up and say, hey, we have this unmet need. Let's, you know, wrap ourselves around this person and meet their needs. And we did that. And we allowed each person to respond to the needs that the one person had addressed. And then Melanie beautifully um, said, you know, now let's ask if this person's needs have been met. And once they were complete, we then were able to move on to someone else who had had some unmet needs in the circle. And I think it's really the evolution of this empathy circle process going deeper, um, honoring what Valerie had presented before as how we can come together in the circle and then be flexible to meet the needs of the people in the circle. And it was just a joy. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Crystal. And Helga, would you share your experience today, please? I'll get just observing. She came in at the end. Oh, thank you. And Sally, would you share your experience, please? Well, we had a little bit of fun in um, kind of shaking things up a little bit different. Um, and I know Alana um, really wanted to um but to have a circle and to have a little bit of feedback 
like a minute from everyone. And um, just on her frustration over that people are just caught up in not talking to one another and um, that nobody wants to really uh, communicate. So um, we did like actually implement a little bit of Valerie's uh, new method and, uh, you know, kind of empowered with that. Yeah. We make sure we take 30 seconds, everyone, so we have time to listen to everyone. Thank you, Sally. And Jonathan, would you share, please? Uh, I'm very grateful to have been here today. Uh, I was able to uh, meet some new people uh, and we all empathized with each other about uh, uh, the struggles that we have in healthcare uh, and uh, in life. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Ilona, would you share, please? Yes. Oh, uh, um, um, sorry, I think this is the same name <laughs> quite. You mean Elena or Ilona? Uh, Ilona. Elena. That's me. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I found this very interesting, this circle, because we start uh, this five minutes each one and turn it back. And to the end, I uh, I opened the circle as a speaker and put a question in, and we share it together. And to the end, it uh, comes together as a whole story. And I had a feeling that we are uh, being at once. We understood each other. It was a very great experience, and I really love it. Thank you, Ilona. And now, Elena, would you share, please? Thank you. Uh, so yeah, uh, thank you uh, for having me this opportunity to be able to get part of this uh, empathy circle today. It has been really good experience uh, for me. Even uh, English is not my first language. Um, I I hope I can continue. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. And Amit, would you share, please? Yeah, uh, it was a new experience for me too. So thanks for that. Uh, in the circle, uh, it was like uh, somebody has to say something and uh, the other one, the actual listener was li listening and uh, just responding or reflecting the same thing, same meaning or maybe uh, many times or same phrase just to just, uh, just for other listeners as a felicitation or support, I think. So it's a kind of a exercise I think it, it was good. It was different for me. Thank you, Amit. And Linda, would you share, please? Um, yeah, I met some new people today. Uh, and it was very interesting, different walks of life uh, and uh, parallels of different professions with the same issues. And so it... Uh, was very informative and uh, I'm looking forward to the next one. Thank you all for having me. Thank you, Linda. And DJ, would you share please? Oh, we had a marvelous, precious empathy circle where empathy was paramount. And um, I feel like I have friends for life right now with all of them. Love you. Thank you, DJ. And Solana, would you share, please? Um, yeah, I had gone to one empathy training before, and when I left it, I had said, oh, I really could try this in my relationship and see how it helps when we get into conflict. Um, and I had shared this time that I didn't do it <laughs> um, because I felt like when I was triggered or feeling defensive that I couldn't slow down enough to actually 
become aware and practice this. So just something that I need to work on some more. Um, but um, then Elena asked, you know, does, does this practice of the empathy circles actually help, you know, can you take it out into your personal life? Can you take it out into the real world? And Jana gave a really great example of um, being able to do that and how, you know, going through the trainings and doing the practice for the last year has helped her um, to just recognize when someone's not feeling heard and to help them feel heard. And then also for herself, knowing when she's not feeling heard and then to, to ask for reflection back for that empathy. Thank you, Solana. And Jana, would you share, please? Yeah, we had uh, initially six and, and then five people in the group and it was uh, very touching and very moving, and very heartfelt. And I'm very grateful to everyone who is in the circle. Thank you. Thank you, Jana. And Matthias, would you share, please? Yeah, thank you. Uh, just like Jonathan, I felt the experience was very, I, I'm, I feel gratitude. I was uh, grateful. I'm grateful. It was a pleasant experience. We have built uh, empathy through reflective listening and got to know each other a bit. So that was very valuable. Um, as far as the role of empathy and peace, peace building in the context of today's session, I think you know we listen to each other, which can be a healing experience. And it was also helpful for me because I was able to share what I'm doing with mediation. Uh, the reflections that I got back were helpful to see if I communicate well enough because English is not my uh, native language. Uh, and lastly, I got uh, a good recommendation for further reading. So looking forward to the next circle. Thank you, Matthias. And yeah, Sek, would you share, please? Um, thank you for this um, circle. Uh, it is very encouraging. It um, inspired me and it... Um, has convinced me to share uh, empathy cafes with my family, which I've been trying to do for a long time. <laughs> now is the time. Um, our breakout room was um, very creative and we designed the process partly as we went along. That was um, new for me. I, I learned uh, from it. Thank you. Thank you, Yatse. <clears throat> Carolyn, would you share, please? Carolyn, you're on mute. Carolyn Dupre, would you share, please? And you're on mute. Okay. There you go. Thank you. Yes. I was looking for the unmute button here. Um, so, um, how does empathy have impact in peace building for me with this experience uh, this afternoon i've uh, shared with my group um actually I, I was noticing this week that i was needing empathy and that the the people who i was sharing with what i was experiencing um lately were not giving me empathy but they were giving me their thoughts about it which was not um, nourishing my need for empathy and and today just having uh, reformulations and reflections um, of whatever I was saying back to me was really an opportunity for me to experience peace and come back to my inner peace so in my perspective when the need for empathy is nourished inside me it sustains me to come in the world from a place of peace, of more inner peace. So I'm really grateful for this experience. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. And Angela, would you share, please? I just wanted to uh, thank everybody for sharing whatever they shared, whether they were a you know, participant in my group or um, the lady facilitating. You know, it takes a lot of... Um, personal courage and also time out of your lives to organize an empathy cafe so i just wanted to say thank you thank you angela and 
Melanie, did I already call on you? No. I'm okay. Please. You know, I was thinking about this quote that I like. It says, uh, change your communication, change your brain. Mm -hmm. And I've been on this journey to change my brain for many, many years. And every time I get to experience an empathy circle, I get uh, a little bit of exercise changing my brain, uh, just observing what's going on with me in each and every moment. Uh, am I in judgment or am I fully present to someone or what, you know? So I appreciate these empathy circles because it really, it's, it's helping me on my journey to change my brain. Thank you, Melanie. And Mary, would you share, please? Hi, yeah, we had a, a, a really nice uh, empathy circle, a lot of collaboration around um, um, some supports that are out there. Um, I felt supported. I felt uh, like uh, I'd expressed some feelings and I felt that I'd, I'd got um, empathy in return. So it was a good experience for me. Thank you, Mary. And Bill, would you share, please? Uh, yeah, I, I'm always um, really amazed uh, about uh, the people that come. Uh, I think the the empathy circle process is great, but I think it's the people and the complexity and everything that they share that um, really, uh, you know, just is constantly new and evolving. So I really have a tremendous amount of appreciation for everyone. Thanks. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Anna, would you share, please? Uh, sure, thank you. Um, uh, we had a lovely group facilitated by Kathy, and uh, it was uh, everyone, we had a listening exercise today, um, listening and reflecting back, and we found basically that all of us, us, well, singing, at least I found that everybody was singing from the same page because we had all the a similar background and done similar work, in a sense, and research and stuff. So, um, but still, we, there were points that came out how important it was to unlearn things, how important it was to respect people and to and if people were being fully heard and if they felt that they could express that. So thank you very much. It was a lovely group. Thank you, Anna. Nathaniel, Nathaniel would you share, please? Yeah, that's me. I would like to say thank you to everyone who participated in the small circle with me, but also the idea that we're sharing the group. Um, this is my first time in the circle. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm always fascinated about learning about uh, empathy since we lived in a very polarized world and not just in the country that I am in, but um, into all the regions of the world that polarization exists. And so empathy would be one of those uh, doors that open uh, to allow us to connect peacefully. So I appreciate all your work. I appreciate all the bringing the people together as well and anyone who share those ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Nathaniel. And Kathy, would you share, please? Yeah, we had a very interesting group. I could have listened to everybody all day long, but it was very short. So um, yeah, thank you all. Thank you, Kathy. And I'd like to share that I just love these empathy circles. And I'm going to keep coming back. What an awesome circle we had today. And Edwin, how was your experience today? Yeah, I was all alone in, this, in, <laughs> in the waiting room. We're trying something different because people come late sometimes, and then we usually just message them and say, oh, you know, you've late, you know, come back next time. We're trying somebody being in the wait room and then letting people in and, and greeting them. And actually three people came and I had a really good uh, conversation uh, with them explaining what we're doing. And uh, so, yeah, the uh, let me just share also the uh, next steps. And uh, I just put a link, some links in to the, into the chat. So that's the monthly uh, conflict transformation series that we're doing. The next one is March. That's a little bit more than a month. And there's a link there that you can uh, sign up and uh, you can uh, volunteer. There's vol links to volunteers. If you're part of an organization that would like to be uh, a co-host, uh, you can find all the information about the, the, this uh, series uh, there. The second link is uh, for our training cohort 12F. That's the Empathy Circle Facilitator Training next week in this time slot. And for the next six weeks, we'll be holding that training. You'll learn how to facilitate an empathy circle. 
And we're actually adding, uh, we used to do five sessions, uh, now we're doing six. And the sixth session is going to be about using the empathy circle for conflict mediation. So how do you uh, actually do uh, some mediations? It's just a taster. It's really a longer course on how to, we need a whole separate course for how to do mediation, but it will be just a, sort of a, an introduction to it. My contact info is there, edwinrutch at gmail.com. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, email me. And uh, also there's a feedback form, the last link there. If you just take a second right now to click on that, if you just click on it, it'll open up a, a Google uh, form and uh, just add your uh, email, your name, and we can add you to our email list. And uh, it's just uh, any kind of feedback suggestions for how to improve or uh, develop the these uh, intro cafes. Uh, so with that, we'd like to thank you all for attending, and we'd like to end with our jazz hands. And Bill just put in his Empathy in the Schools info link. You can grab all of that. And if you're a facilitator, if you could stay back just for a debrief, we like to. And let's get all those. I'll meet everybody. We can get, get a group portrait. We hold those, hold those jazz hands. Let's get it. Yeah, there we go. Everybody in on it. It's a nice ending photograph. Goodbye for now, and thank you so much for uh, taking part. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. We'll email you. Bye. Recording, Bill.